Romans chapter 5, justified by faith, 6. Romans chapter 5. I want to read just the first four verses here. I don't want to bite off more than I can chew. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. i, I got to stop there. Because you know, I, I, I'll make that inclusive later on in the message, in and out of it. But for now, Father, thank you. Oh, thank you for the richness and the sense of your presence here today. And Father, as we pray, and oftentimes we are apt to ask you, for your presence. Lord, in all reality, we may be asking you to help us to realize your presence as your presence abides in your children. And Father, I thank you. I thank you that we are not alone. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. We all have the same Spirit of God. For those who know Jesus, We've come together to worship you, to exalt your name. Now I ask you, Father, to minister your truth to our being. Oh, Father, praise your name. We praise you in the Son, and we thank you in his name. Amen. So we are talking about the result or the benefits or the consequence of justification for the believer. Most scholars... Well, okay, let me clarify that. All the scholars that I read about do not include my first point. However, uh, their loss, not mine. Uh, I began with the child of God is justified by faith. I, I, I laid into that, labored into that for us. What it means to be justified by faith. My second point was the believer has peace with God as a benefit of justification. And through Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith faith into this grace in which we stand. And we talked about that last week. And number four, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Some of your translations will use the word boast instead of rejoice. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. As we make our way through this, I want to remind you of the paramount importance of understanding these rich biblical doctrines. And we, like I said last time we were together, we may not grasp the theological definition and aspects of it, but we need to know something of it from a biblical context because it will be vitally important as we come to understand these wonderful biblical doctrines, it is important for us to understand in that it will help us when we proclaim Christ to the lost sinner. It will have an impact on us in the way we live our life before Him. Not only will we, will we, will we proclaim Christ verbally, we proclaim Christ through the way we live. And these doctrines help keep us centered in Christ. They really do. Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The fourth consequence or benefit of justification that Paul mentions here in Romans 5, 2 is the hope of the glory of God. Paul says we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Literally, let us boast in hope of the glory of God. Now listen, we think of the word rejoice and we think of the word boast. In the Greek, they mean the same thing but it's probably not what we think it means whatsoever. A few weeks ago, we talked about coming boldly into the presence of God, being assured of the, the confidence that we have 
uh, in this access of fi- by faith with Jesus Christ. To rejoice is to express an unusually high degree of confidence. And this is the same meaning for the word boast. A high degree, unusually high degree of confidence. And that's important for us to understand as we continue on in this text. To have a high, unusually high degree of confidence in what has been promised to those who are justified by faith. It, is, is it, it becomes exceptionally noteworthy to boast. And it's not as you stick your head high, square your shoulders back, and say, I'm going to boast in the Lord. Paul said, all of our boasting is in Jesus Christ. It's in Christ. Nothing that we have done, nothing that we have attained on our own merits, all that we are, as the Scripture says, as Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. You are the Christian you are, in the positive sense, because of the grace of God. Now don't blame Christ, don't blame God if you are not in the place where you should be. That's for another time, I guess. So it is one thing to rejoice or boast confidently in something that has happened or been achieved. That's easy to do that, right? This is rejoicing with certainty as that one thing has already happened and the person rejoices. It is another thing altogether, however, to rejoice confidently, unusually confident in something that has not yet happened, but is as certain to happen as if it already has happened. Do you need me to repeat that? It is one thing altogether to rejoice confidently in something that has not yet happened, but is as certain to happen as if it already has happened. This is the boasting. This is the rejoicing we bring in our worship to the Lord. And I think that plays into, bless the Lord, O my soul. Are you confident in the promises of Jesus Christ for the believer as we come to worship Him. I believe that a mark of spiritual growth is in how we worship God. Or whether or not we truly believe what the Scriptures say. There are several marks, by the way, that being one factor of it. James in his customary forthright way, says someone, one scholar, tells us to count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And he says, in case we are inclined to modify these words as the utopian command of one who had not really experienced sorrow, let us remember that James was one of the principal leaders of the Christians in Jerusalem who continually faced persecutions from those outside the church, culminating in his own martyrdom in his 60s, as well as internal dissension associated with a Judaizing element, James surely knew what it meant to meet various trials. The early church experienced, and we're going to talk about suffering later on, but they experienced persecution and suffering like we have never had. And one point about suffering Two things. Number one, it's real and it's painful. It's real and it's painful. We've only covered 50% of that in Western culture. You see, but James had also learned that difficulties can produce steadfastness or patience through the natural reaction. Though the natural reaction is annoyance or bitterness, he never tells us to pretend that a trial is non-existent. Instead, he wants us to recognize and rejoice that any problem can be the occasion for God to work in and through us in a way that he otherwise would not. So when you are facing a trial, you may not understand the whole thing of it, 
or why God has allowed it, but one thing you can plant your feet for sure on is this, that God has a plan for your life, and God is working something out in your life that only that trial will bring about for you. And he says, rejoice. (laughs) Rejoice. About 99% of the members of the church on Monday morning don't even want to hear that. Rejoice when you encounter trials of various kinds. Rejoice. You see, the rejoicing that we're talking about here is anchored in faith. It is anchored in faith, and that is we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This is a big topic, (laughs) like all of them. Hope of the glory of God. This is a definite anticipation of sharing God's future glory. The word hope in English is rather weak. To to hope means to want something without certainty. To hope is to want something without certainty. But the Greek word underlying it, the Greek word is pronounced elpis means a conviction. It means a conviction, this hope. Hope, conviction of the glory of God. And I want us to make the connection here. Christian hope is not a hopeful wish based on uncertainty. Christian hope is not a hopeful wish. It is is a hope-filled certainty anchored In our faith. Anchored in our faith. That's that's vital. That's key to understanding this. You see, everything about our walk with the Lord is both a spiritual matter and a faith matter. It's a spiritual matter and a faith matter. Everything. Hebrews 11.1 now says in the ESV, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The hope, the conviction, the confidence that we are going to receive something that has not yet happened, but we know for certainty that it is. We live with that conviction. R.C. Sproul says the word hope, el peace in the Greek, is one of the richest terms we find anywhere in the New Testament. It is the gift that God gives to every person justified by faith. It is the gift of God given to every person who is justified by faith. It is a hope that radically, he says, differs from our normal understanding of hope. It sure is. Sure is. Christian hope is not uncertain. It is a joyful and confident expectation which rests on the promises of God. Does that bring comfort? Do the promises of God bring comfort to your soul? Do the promises of God confront you in your trial to remind you to whom you belong and it's going to be okay as you rest in Christ? Are we reminded of those things? Do we find it a first reaction to praise God when encountering a trial or in the midst of a trial or do we have to sift through the human side of everything first before we get to the place where we look heavenward. Someone told me a long time ago who had been diagnosed with cancer. And I went to visit him and we were the same age, actually. And He told me, he said, I've never had the spiritual battle of praying and getting in the Word like I have with this cancer. You know, that's normal. I've heard that from so many Christians because faith is called front and center in our life through affliction, through the trial. And yet, he, now this guy was pretty anchored in Christ. Pretty anchored in Christ. And of course, He knew that what he had to do. 
And he drew near to the Lord. The Lord blessed him in a marvelous, miraculous way. This hope is joyful and confident expectation. Christians should be the most confident people in the world. And expecting people. When we look to the eastern sky, we're not looking at the sunrise. We shouldn't, well, yes, we get beautiful sunrises here in Maine. But what I mean by that is we should expectantly, confidently look to the eastern sky, as the scripture says, knowing that Christ is coming. We can be sure of that. Why do you disciples stand around here gazing up into heaven like you are? as though you're never going to see him again. This same Jesus that has been taken up from you today will come again in like manner just as he has left. He will come again. And man, those guys went back to Jerusalem and the world got turned upside down. We could be asked the question, do you think that the New England Patriots will win the Super Bowl? And we would probably answer humbly now for us, Patriots fans, I don't know, but I hope so. I, I don't know, but I, I hope so. The use of the word hope expresses the, the desire that certain things will come to pass, but we have no assurance that they will. No matter how positive some may, someone may sound and sit and talk about the stats, and, you know, it just kills me with that, you know. All of these analysts sit around the, the pregame stuff and they talk about the stats. I heard, uh, I, I think it was Michael Jordan the other night talking about the Celtics and the Warriors playing in the NBA playoffs. And said, he said, you know, if, if this goes into the triple digits, you know that the Celtics won't win. Well, guess what? The Celtics won. 116 to something, I believe it was. We, we hope, this, is, this expresses desire that certain things will come to pass, but we have no assurance that they will. And this is not the hope that Paul is stressing in our text. It's not the hope at all. This, this is not the biblical concept of hope whatsoever. Hopeful wishing, the hope we are talking about, the Bible describes metaphorically. Brings that to our attention. This hope we, ha we have, it says in Hebrews 6.19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. An anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. What's the presence behind the veil? Jesus. Jesus, our high priest, is behind the veil. This hope leads us behind the veil into the presence of the Lord God Almighty. This speaks of the certainty of our Christian hope. The certainty of our Christian hope. Christians should be confident. Christians should be certain. And these truths will govern our lives as we give to them. Not just here on Sunday mornings, but we give to them this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow, throughout the week in our devotions, in our time with the Lord, in our work, in our socializing, Whatever, these things should govern the way we live and serve Jesus Christ. We engage in conversation, as we are learning in our men's Bible study. We're going through Alistair Begg's book, Big Prayer. He says, when we converse with each other, we're speaking from the head. When we converse with God, we're speaking from the heart. We need to Learn how to converse with God in all things, even as we converse with each other, and not compartmentalize it. You know, I've done my, my 20 minutes of prayer, Bible reading. Uh, today, I, I can get on with my day now and enjoy my day. Compartmentalizing. And Paul says the attitude of prayer should be unceasing in our life. We have an anchor, this hope that we have in Jesus Christ. This hope we have, I like that, the words we have, this hope we have in Hebrews 6.19. We have, it means we've obtained it 
We own it. We possess it. It's been given to us as a gift. This this hope we have as an anchor, it ensures safety. This in describing sure and steadfast isn't talking about just an anchor. It's talking about the hope you have in Jesus Christ. Let's break from the metaphor here. I mean, some of you that were in the Navy or have boats with anchors on them, uh, you, you, you can relate with this. An anchor is to ensure safety and prevent or restrict movement in the water. Prevent your boat from taking off with the wind, from going every which way, being tossed in truth. And tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, James 1, 7 and 8. This hope keeps us anchored. This hope keeps us stable. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, James says. The one, the Christian who is not confident in this hope is unstable. I don't like to be around unstable people. And if we're not careful, it becomes contagious. We are confident, stable, because of the anchor we have in Jesus. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, the inner self. It is equated with the spirit of a man, self or personality, the whole being, in other words. Our whole being, even though we don't understand it all, That that doesn't restrain the hand and power of God working in your life just because we don't understand it. I don't understand everything there is to know about redeeming love. The Lord's salvation. That's why I get excited about the salvation of the Lord preaching and teaching the gospel message because there's always so much for us to know and understand and share in Him. Our very being, and you know, when studying this, I pray, God, help me in my very being to be given to you in all things and to absorb this truth. Break us, break us until we are there in our very being, both sure and steadfast. Jesus gives us this gift of hope that is sure and steadfast, confident. Again, confident, assuring, comforting, huh? Comforting. And which enters the presence behind the veil. Hmm. This hope takes every believer, every believer behind the veil where Jesus has entered as our high priest. That's big stuff, by the way. That's important stuff. Man, that's... uh, We have so much in Jesus. So much in Jesus. I, I, I truly pity the Christian who never arrives at the place of fully embracing this through grace. I've known Christians who will die never fully confident here. Never embracing the grace that God has given to us, this hope that we have. And they go to death loving the Lord. I'm not questioning their genuineness of their love for the Lord. But never dying going from this life fully confident in these promises. I truly pity them. I do. In the, new, in the translator's New Testament, it says of Hebrews 6.19, this hope is ours. It is like an anchor for our souls. It is sure and firm. It goes through the curtain into the inner sanctuary. You know, you go back to Old Covenant Israel and the the high priestly order 
Only the high priest could go, you know, into behind the veil, into the holy of holies. Jesus' death on the cross rent the veil in twain, opened up access to the very presence of God for those who confess Him as Lord and Savior and believe in their heart that God raised Him from the dead. Romans 9, 10, 9 and 10. Every one of us has received the presence behind the veil. The Holy Spirit. Every one of us has received the presence of the Holy Spirit. Thereby bringing us, introducing us, giving us access into the presence of Jesus Christ. And whether we get it all or not, it's ours. By grace. And we are to live our life, now listen, with conviction. We are to live our life giving to Christ in all things. In all things. If we sin, and we go to this all the time. If we sin, we do have an advocate with the Father. Jesus, the righteous. We are called to confess our sins before God in prayer. And He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we do not confess those sins, listen, church, we begin to restrain this gift of grace. We begin to step away from what God wants to do in our lives. We begin to, well, I guess, to say it would be, we give over to the authority of the enemy instead of the authority of which Christ has set us free in. Listen, church, um, I said last week, and, and this is true, when, when we die as Christians, we will die with sin in us. We have a sin nature. And we are to do everything that we can in this life, in, in compliance with the truth of God's Word, out of obedience, not that we're earning it, we are responding by faith, in following Christ, everything that we can do in this life to avoid sin. And when we do, and we will, we need to quickly take it to the throne and not continue in it. Not continue in it. Because you have been washed. You have been sanctified. You have been justified. We have an anchor. We've all sang this beautiful hymn by Priscilla Owens. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Hmm. It's a beautiful hymn, isn't it? To remind us of what we have. Oh, church, why would anybody, why would we as Christians want to live anything less than what God has provided for us? Why? Why? Why would we think that the pleasures of sin are, are far more joyous than walking with the Lord and enjoying all of these wonderful, gracious benefits we receive in Him? Our hope is anchored in the promise of Christ's coming. An illustration I came across when the learned and wealthy John Selden, John Selden was a 
a very knowledgeable and educated man of his time, lived several hundred years ago, and scholars of his day said he was the most knowledgeable man that they knew on the face of the earth at that time now. But it says, when the learned and wealthy John Selden was dying, he said to Archbishop Usher, I have surveyed most of the learning that is among the sons of men, and my study is filled with books and manuscripts. He had 8,000 volumes in his library on various subjects. But at present, he says, I cannot recollect any passage out of all my books and papers whereon I can rest my soul, save this one from sacred scripture. And this is what he quotes. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. <laughs> I think he had something there, don't you? And he was not a pastor or a minister. He was an educator a knowledgeable individual. The object of our hope is the glory of God. What is glory? What is the glory of God? The quality of splendor. The quality of splendor. Remarkable appearance, brightness, glory and splendor. Moses asked God if he could see his glory. Show me your glory. And the scripture says, God told Moses, you cannot see my face and live. No man can see my face in its full glory and live. But God was so gracious to Moses. He took Moses up the mount, and there was a place in the rock, a cleft, that God put Moses in there. Can you, kind of like a little rock closet there. Huh? <laughs> And he puts Moses in there, and he puts his hand over the opening so Moses can't see. And the Bible says that the glory of God began to pass by. And God himself was shouting shouts of deliverance concerning his name. And as the glory of God went by, God slightly brought his hand back so that Moses would see the hinder part of his glory. Moses goes down from the mount after that, and people can't even look at him. He is glowing with such radiance in such a way that he had to veil his face. But that glory began to fade over time. And Paul makes the contrast of that fading glory to that of the law in contrast to grace the grace that we have received in Jesus. Because the greater has replaced the lesser. The stronger has replaced the weakened. The high priesthood of Jesus Christ has replaced the law of Moses. Because he is the son of God. And he has accomplished all things for us to know and be reconciled to the Father. God's glory is how we describe the sum effect of all of His attributes. Grace, truth, goodness, mercy, justice, knowledge, power, eternality. All that He is. All that He is. We sum it up by saying it's God's glory. Therefore, the glory of God is intrinsic. The glory of God is intrinsic. That is, it is as essential to God as the light is to the sun, as blue is to the sky, as wet is to water. You don't make the sun light, it is light. You don't make the sky blue, it is blue. You don't make water wet, it is wet. In all of these cases, the attribute is intrinsic to the object. In contrast, man's glory is granted to him. 
The glory that we have of this flesh has been granted to us. If you take a king and take off all his robes and crowns and give him only a rag to wear and leave him on the streets for a few weeks, when put next to a beggar, you'll never know the difference after a couple of weeks go by and you see him out there on the street. Because that king's glory is not intrinsic of himself. His glory is his crown and his clothes and his position given to him. He has no intrinsic glory. And that's the point here. That's the point. The only glory that men have is granted to them. The glory that God has is His in His essence. You, you can't de-glory God because glory is His nature. Glory defines Him. You can't touch His glory. It cannot be taken away. It cannot be added to. It is His being. When we spend time thinking about the glory of God and we try to put it into words, words that express His glory, it may be that the only word we can use is greatness. That's where I am. In our human, finite way of thinking, we oftentimes cannot put into words exactly what it is that has moved our very soul at the thought of God. The word greatness helps me to do just that. Greatness, majesty. I'll close with this. In 1715, Louis XIV of France died. Louis, who called himself the Great, was the monarch who made the infamous statement, I am the state. Pretty pompous, wasn't it? His court was the most magnificent in all of Europe. And his funeral was spectacular, recorded for us. His body lay in a golden coffin. And to dramatize the deceased king's greatness, orders were, had been given that the cathedral should be very dimly lighted with only one special candle set above his coffin. Thousands waited in hushed silence. Then Bishop Massillon began to speak. And slowly reaching down, he snuffed out the candle, saying, Only God is great. Powerful, isn't it? Only God is great. We've seen men and women who want to promote themselves as great. Great. The goat. Huh? Only God is great. In His glory, in His majesty, in His kingdom, in His rule over all of creation, God is great. And it is in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have that realized because of what He has done. And our coming to the Lord in faith has opened up all of that for us in Jesus, in Jesus. Oh, church, what a wonderful Savior we serve. What a wonderful God we serve. Is it any wonder then that we would be required to bring Him our best? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. Amen.